Alex, uh, as you know, I've been interested in philosophy for my whole life, uh, not in a professional way, but maybe a quasi-professional way. And I've done molecular biology. Uh, in my early uh, education and, and research, I was involved in DNA and RNA separations and various uh, kinds of things. And I've followed the development of uh, molecular biology pretty, pretty closely over the decades. And I never saw a need to think about the philosophy of molecular biology. I've, I've been interested in the philosophy of mathematics, the philosophy of physics, the philosophy of religion, philosophy of mind, especially mind and religion, uh, but I never saw a need. Um, as I began looking at philosophy of biology, I, I, I obviously came across much of your work and I, I discovered that, you are, that the philosophy of molecular biology and genes or genetics is a, one of your many specialties. So I want to understand, first of all, why is there a need for this? So it's interesting that um, the agenda of interest among philosophers of biology in molecular biology starts very much from an, a, a need driven by a purely philosophical problem or maybe a problem in the history and philosophy of science. There's this picture of the progress of science starting with Newton and carrying on through the 18th and 19th and into the 20th century of progress in science as consisting in the reduction of higher level theories mm -hmm. to lower level theories. And that reduction does two things. It not only explains the higher level laws by appeal to the lower level laws, okay, but enables us to correct and improve the precision and the predictive power and the application of the higher level regularities by their reduction to the lower level regularities. And there's a particular analysis that philosophers of physics offered from the time of the logical positivists onwards that illuminates this reductionist research program that characterizes the progress of science from the beginning of the scientific revolution. And then in the post-war period, you get the revolution in molecular biology. And the question immediately arises, does the reduction of physiology, respiration, the urea cycle, the TCA mm -hmm. cycle, mm -hmm. to fundamental molecular biology mm -hmm. vindicate the picture of reduction that we got from the rest of science? If it does, then that's a vindication of physicalism yes. about the nature of the biological domain. Yes. And if it doesn't, then that's going to suggest that there might be some room for strong emergence or weak emergence or some kind of irreducible levels of organization in the biological domain that have not yet been, are to be found in the physical domain. And one of the implications of the possibility of such an irreducibility in the relationship between physiology and molecular biology and genetics is that might be a harbinger of what we're gonna find in the reduction of cognitive psychology to neuroscience. And so there was a lot of interest starting from the period of Watson and Crick's discoveries in trying to see whether we could extend the picture of reduction that characterized the rest of science to the biological domain. Mm. And the belief that there were gonna be serious implications for more controversial issues that might emerge from that uh, uh, question. And I was so interested in it, partly because none of the philosophers of biology were at that time, when I first began to be thinking about this, equipped to digest and understand what mm. was going on in the revolution in molecular biology. So I got myself a couple of, of fellowships and I went back to graduate school. I was mm. a full professor and I went back yeah. to graduate school to learn molecular biology in order to try to understand what this relationship was. Mm. And I and a couple of other people began to figure out what was going on and what was going on was some very serious difficulties for the off-the-shelf standard picture of reduction. And those difficulties were turned out to have major ramifications for the reducibility of the psychological okay, so what, to the neural. So what are, let's just stick with molecular biology in, in the biological process. I think when we get into philosophy of mind and neural, that, that, that's a, it's a new area. I agree it would have, uh, it, 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 would, it might influence our thinking, but it wouldn't necessarily control our thinking. 
because uh, arguably consciousness may be something a different kind of thing. It's, right. It's a t totally separate area. But in molecular biology, what were those issues that you first surfaced that were suddenly, uh, that you suddenly found there that, that were potentially disturbing? So in the classic examples of the reduction of higher level theories to lower level theories, the way in which the reduction proceeded was by a conceptual connection between a higher level property and a definition of that higher level property in the terms of the lower level theories. Mm -hmm. And the classic simplest example was temperature in the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. Temperature is defined as the mean kinetic energy of the molecules. And suddenly with that definition, you have a reduction of heat to molecular motion. Mm -hmm. And now we understand yeah, heat in the 19th century with this great conceptual breakthrough of Kelvin's. Yeah. If the Nobel Prize had existed at that time, he would have won it just for making this conceptual connection. And now in the 20th century, when Watson and Crick apply themselves to the major problem of understanding the mechanism of the gene, okay, they want a definition of the gene in terms of the nucleic acids. Yes. And it turns out when they finally propound a structure for DNA, okay, it turns out that you can't produce that required definition. And all of a sudden the question emerges, well, if we can't define the gene in terms of some string of nucleic acids. The base okay? pairs. Yeah. The base pairs. If we can't, then does that suggest that the gene has some autonomous existence independent mm. of the macromolecules? No, that's ridiculous. But on the other hand, if we're going to insist that the gene is nothing but the macromolecules, why is it we can't define the gene in terms of the macromolecules? Now, the reason we can't do it is because of the redundancy of the code and the multiple different structures right, of molecules, each of which can give us the functional role of the gene. So the gene for hemoglobin, okay, if you, if you tried to list all the different nucleic acid sequences that are equivalent to the gene for hemoglobin, you'd never finish the job. Mm. And that heterogeneity of the reduction base for the higher level property, okay, that produces a lot of conceptual um, problems at a minimum and at a maximum generates a real emergence hmm. of the higher level from the lower level. Yeah, but, but, and that's where so much of the action in arguments about emergence emer arose in the philosophy of biology. Yeah, uh, but, but isn't the case that it's just a, a question of knowledge because it's not a simple base pair, but it's multiple base pairs and some are, there's, there's some junk in there and, 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 and it's, the evolution has caused different things. So it's, it's not some deep philosophical problem. It's just a knowledge problem of figuring out what a gene is. Well, you, you say it's not a deep philosophical problem. It's, it's just a knowledge problem. But the knowledge problem is the sort of, you know, mother load of the philosophy of science. <laughs> so if it turns out that so far as uh, useful knowledge is concerned for agriculture or medicine mm -hmm. or physiology, yep. the molecular basis is too complicated and cannot be deployed, then there's going to be an argument by those who think that emergence is an epistemic matter that it's vindicated by the uselessness and the uh, uh, unnecessary complication of the macromolecular base. And then there are other people like me who are going to argue that, you, that this argument reflects a confusion about our, our useful knowledge and the yeah. nature of reality. Right. The nature of reality is it's nothing but macromolecules. For purposes of agriculture and medicine and pharmacology. Yeah, you gotta figure out how it works. <laughs> yeah, you can help yourself to these heuristic devices. But the, the position that sort of I take as a reductionist is either the gene is reducible to the macromolecule or the gene, there's no such thing as a gene, it's just a heuristic device that we employ, okay, 
because of a, an agenda of our technological and other kinds of interests, but isn't reflected in the nature of biological reality. And you know, that debate, is that an epistemic debate? Is that a metaphysical mm -hmm. debate? It's certainly an, a real question for the philosophy of biology. Are there really genes, or is that just a useful fiction? Mm 